Welcome to You Aspire's EdTech Impact Innovation to Expand College Access and Success event. We thank you for joining us this evening and today, wherever you may be located. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we begin the program. This event is being recorded and will be made available post uh, the event. Uh, any questions and all questions will be captured in the chat function. Please enter uh, as you have questions and they will be answered uh, by the panelists. You will note that we are live tweeting this evening under the hashtag EdTechImpact and hashtag partnership with a Twitter handle at, at USPIRE. Again, we thank you for joining us for this very um, vibrant and what we think will be an impactful conversation. And I now turn it over to Claire Dennison. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us from across the country. We're delighted to see familiar names as well as new ones join this virtual audience. We recognize your lives are busy and Zoom filled. And so we're especially grateful to you for carving out the time for this rich conversation. My name is Claire Dennison and I proudly serve as U Aspire's Chief Program Officer. I've worked at U Aspire for over 11 years now and I've had a front row seat to its innovation and impact. Before I turn the mic over to our panelists, I just wanted to briefly introduce U Aspire and share our connection to education technology work or ed tech. For those of you meeting us for the first time, we are a national educational nonprofit, hyper-focused on college affordability. We reach students through advising them directly, training their practitioners, consulting with student serving organizations, and engaging in policy and systems change efforts on a state and federal level. Like many organizations, back in early March when COVID-19 struck, we had to think quickly about how to shift our work. Luckily for us, we had a strong foundation in technology because since 2011, we have been actively embracing it for impact in our affordability space. Through our advising work, we've led our field by utilizing text messaging and other virtual platforms to reach and support students. Through our training work, we have focused on how to creatively leverage webinar technology long before Zoom was a household name in order to engage and educate practitioners. We've also built direct to student tech tools like the recently released college cost calculator, fully digitizing something we've been iterating on for years. And finally, we've also collaborated with various stakeholders from federal student aid to the college board to offer our affordability expertise as they innovated their own student facing technology products. So back to March and since then, we were lucky that we didn't have to scramble to find ways to continue our work. Instead, we looked for ways to expand and capitalize on the tools and the partnerships we had at our disposal in order to make our work even better. And since then, we've investigated new ways of leveraging technology, both internally for our organization and externally for our stakeholders. We know we are lucky and we have not taken any of our partnerships and learning for granted during this time. So this evening, we're thrilled to share some of that and bring forward key and leading voices in education, technology, and innovation investing for what we believe will be two great conversations on what's happening now and what's next for students and institutions alike. So at this point, I'd like to introduce one of our co-hosts this evening, Jen Stradler. Jen is the Vice President of Workforce Development at Salesforce and a current member of our U.S. Buyers National Board of Directors. We're very lucky and grateful for her support. And at this point, I'll turn the mic over to you, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, Claire, and welcome everyone. We're so excited to have you join. It's fun to continue to hear the welcome beeps um, as more and more of you join. And um, a huge uh, shout out, Claire, to you and the whole US Buyer team for all the work that you all do to make um, the organization possible. Uh, so as Claire mentioned, I'm Jen Stradler. Uh, I lead the workforce development team at Salesforce. and. Uh, the hat I'm more proud of tonight is that I am a proud U.S. Fire board member. Uh, I've been working with U.S. Fire uh, for many years, and one of the reasons I'm most drawn to the organization is that its work sits at the intersection of education and equity, and as you just heard from Claire, also very much at the intersection of technology. And this year especially has certainly demonstrated that these issues have never been more deeply connected. COVID-19 has exacerbated disparities in equitable access to both education and technology. And that's exactly why we're having this conversation tonight. 
I'm thrilled that we have such strong leaders across K-12, higher ed, and the nonprofit sector to share their insights about equity and education in the time of virtual schooling, a global pandemic, and a long overdue racial justice reckoning. And so a, a sincere thanks in advance yeah, to Adrian Curtis and Jennifer for joining us tonight and to Rob for leading us in this discussion. And Rob, over to you to get us going. Thank you, Jen. Uh, and thanks to you, Aspire, for hosting this conversation. I'm really excited to be here with um, my colleagues. So um, thanks for taking the time to join us. And just a reminder, if you're coming on later, that we're live tweeting at you, Aspire. And you can use the hashtag EdTechImpact and hashtag partnership. So I thought kind of a way to jump in would be to ask each of you to tell us how you work with students in your organization and how college affordability aligns with your kind of institutional goals and priorities. And um, maybe start with Jennifer. Thanks, Rob. Um, I work at the College Board. Um, we connect students to colleges throughout the country, um, either through our SAT program or our advanced placement program, um, as well as a range of sort of tools and supports that we provide to students um, as they work to go through the college process. Um, this year, we have really tried to innovate um, to do a couple of things um, with a particular focus in the affordability space, uh, but one to make the most important steps uh, in the path to college as visible, simple, and clear as possible. Uh, and so we have identified the sort of core six steps that we see in that process, um, one of which is obviously completing the FAFSA, which is the way that most students qualify for federal financial aid, as well as ultimately access work study programs, um, as well as the potential to lock, unlock other state um, aid programs as well. And so this year, working in partnership with the Benefits Data Trust, uh, we launched a uh, tool called Wyatt, uh, and it is a online chat bot that is available for all students for free. Uh, it's accessible 24 seven by text message. Um, but we knew um, that we were in particular worried about low income students and ensuring that they were able to participate, have other ways to access advice, knowing that so much of the FAFSA support for students was done through in-person events at school or community groups, uh, and that much of that would just be more limited right now, given the circumstances. Uh, and so we launched Wyatt uh, on October 1st. Uh, students can access it at getfafsahelp.org. Uh, um, and we're, we're really hoping that it becomes a, a digital asset that students can use to get the advice they need in the process. We're also hoping um, that advisors and counselors are also able to use it because even as we all live in this digital world, like never has access to caring adults uh, and good advice been more important. So we're also working as hard as we can to get that tool um, in the hands of caring adults who can also help students. So that's a little bit of what we have been doing so far, Rob. Great, that's a lot, not a little, um, thanks. Adrian, what about from your view in New Hampshire? Yeah, th uh, thanks, Rob. And you know, there's a word that Jennifer used that I think we should really pay attention to. And she talked about the digital environment. And oftentimes, uh, the way that I often think of this work that we do, and even in the higher ed space, is that uh, we're talking about a, a digital environment or a digital ecosystem, when very much of what students and learners and families and communities have been used to is an analog environment. And so when we talk about this digital environment, and this is very much uh, supports the hallmark of the mission of SNHU, which is really about transforming lives. Um, we think of uh, the nexus of our work at, the, at that place where um, learners and students and communities are often marginalized from uh, the higher ed system. And so when we think about this digital environment, obviously there are things, we, you know, the digital divide and all of those things that we think about, but how do you answer the question uh, through the work that you do that helps to mitigate that by actually looking at the digital environment or that ecosystem as a way to enhance accessibility, uh, to enhance affordability 
and to enhance success and beyond. And so one of the uh, questions that we often ask in our meetings, be it a management meeting all the way through is, can we say that a student that started with SNHU is better off when they leave us than when they started? That's great. Thanks, Adrian. And Curtis, on the ground from your perspective in Oakland. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, <clears throat> uh, and thank you for, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you, uh, you Aspire, for, for having this uh, event. Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, we're, we're a K-12 system. Uh, we have about, um, between our district-run schools and our authorized charter schools, close to 50,000 students. We have around 75% of our students qualify for free to reduce lunch. But I just wanted to say like, our mission and vision is been focused for almost the past decade on being a full service community school district focused on serving the whole child, eliminating inequities and preparing every child for college career and community. And so that college career community readiness has really been our rallying cry for close to a decade. And all of the things that that means, literally we have you know, very much a cradle to career framework in the district in terms of how we partner with the city, how we think about our work. And so everything we really think about from the time a child's born in Oakland, what is it gonna take for us as a community and as a school system to get them over that finish line and graduate and have all the opportunity that we want all of our students to have. And that clearly involves college affordability. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the um, cornerstones of being a full service community school district is the idea that our system is necessary but insufficient, meaning that it's really the old kind of African proverb about being a village to raise a child. I mean, that's really how we approach education. And so our Oakland promise, which has been a collaboration between the mayor and the school district and a whole host of grassroots and other community organizations, starts off, it's, it's a cradle to career college accessibility and college persistence strategy that starts off with college savings accounts for babies. And currently we have 750 babies that have a $500 um, savings account and it builds through a kindergarten to college program. We have a joint future centers and a whole college counseling, college um, accessibility. Fastest completion, as Jennifer mentioned, is a huge part. We have many partners working on uh, making sure that we uh, get to 100% FAFSA completion for all of our students. Um, and then we've already had, um, since we started this effort, 1,800 graduates awarded $14 million of scholarship uh, funds uh, to attend a CTE, a two-year, four-year um, program. So. You know, that's really, and maybe some of the things that we'll get to later is just, you know, keep in mind that, you know, our our work really is around making sure, and I just want, let me just go back to that other piece. 88% of the kids that got those scholarships qualify as very low income and 80% are first in their family to go to college. So our focus is really on closing the equity gap around college access, affordability, and persistence. We want our kids to finish college, not just get there. Um, so that theme, you know, resonates with, you know, a lot of the other pieces that, that we've done uh, to make sure kids have the conditions to get there um, really from pre-K all the way through 12. Great, thanks, Curtis. And um, for those of you just coming in as a reminder, you can submit questions in the chat and we'll have time towards the end of this segment to get to them. So um, kind of opening up the conversation, I think one of the things that's been acknowledged already, as, as Adrian said, is the numerous challenges that kind of COVID has presented um, for everyone in every segment of education. But before we kind of get to some of those challenges, I think it would be interesting to think about kind of as we've shifted to kind of all things virtual, what opportunities or surprising things have you seen surface as we've made this shift to virtual learning, thinking about form completion, college affordability support, and other things that um, you've seen or you've thought about kind of from your vantage point. And I'll open that up to anyone. Yeah, Rob, I'll start with that. Um, you know, I'd mentioned before about this digital ecosystem and um, one of the things, uh, so SNHU is uh, one of the largest nonprofit 
uh, universities in the country with about 170,000 students. We have programs all around the, the globe, actually. And one of the things that we found that was a surprise, uh, to, to definitely to me and to uh, my colleagues, is that because we uh, you know, we, we have our content on a platform and the access and the digital environment, uh, we actually saw uh, students actually completing uh, their competencies and their content faster in the COVID environment. And so one might surmise it might be because, well, there's not much else to do. Uh, but again, remembering uh, the demand signals that we were receiving and who we were serving, and you might think that these might be the most vulnerable populations relative to education uh, within this environment. But because uh, we saw um, uh, our partners and the transformative nature of partnerships all very quickly move to a virtual environment. They didn't have to move hardware, software, all the, they literally just had to extract themselves from buildings, but the services and the supports continued. Um, and so the surprise for me uh, was to actually see the acceleration of, of pace um, in ways that uh, were still proving uh, to be not only effective, but uh, the efficacy of the work and the outcomes uh, were really very real. We, we have seen similar um, that it, it has enabled exploration of colleges and the college going process to happen in new ways um, and enabled many more students to participate in that um, when you when the only way to go is not to sort of get in the car and, and do a trip. Uh, and so it's been really great to see all that innovation of sort of having different ways to tour mm -hmm. schools, get information, lots of new ways of doing that. And so I think that's been a really powerful tool for sort of new ways of engaging, new ways of exploring that's open up for, for many. Yeah, I'll just add quickly, I, I, I think for kids that were already, um, as Adrian said, you know, in the digital, not the analog world, um, which, you know, happen to be some of our more privileged students, I think that there's been some real opportunity. One of the gaps we identified very quickly when we went and shelter in place and closed in the Bay Area under COVID at the very end of March was that we had about nine, over 900 college bound seniors uh, that we recognized did not actually have a device at home. So these were students mm. that were probably relying on our future centers. Um, they were relying on you know things that we basically provided in the brick and mortar schools in terms of access to technology. And so we very quickly, um, Basically, we raised a bunch of private money, and I can get into our Oakland Undivided campaign later, but that particular group of students who are already were college bound. We got um, over 900 of them a computer, uh, about 600 of them actually needed Wi-Fi connection. We got them 5G hotspots, and we provided them tech support all the way up through. They kept these computers. They were actually gifted. They weren't loaners to make sure they could continue to stay connected to their college of acceptance in terms of completing forms, getting orientations done. Because we knew that if they didn't have that access to technology, the likelihood of them showing up or having been in a place to be able to complete all of their entry exams, uh, connecting with orientations, that we would have lost so many of those kids to their um, to the start of their college. And so, you know, I think just some of the opportunities, you know, this, the digital divide, um, is real. <laughs> and, you know, we've been laser focused uh, in Oakland on using this opportunity to not just address the immediate digital divide with COVID, but to really say, we're going to solve this for the long haul, you know, and there's a whole bunch of work happening around that. Uh, but it's just critical in a world where we all have been living digitally for years, and there's still so many American households that do not have access to technology uh, in a way that allows them not just to participate in education, but if you want to file for unemployment, you got to get online. There's all kinds of things that come to you in healthcare, social services, a job, workforce development, et cetera, that happen online now. And so for us, it was not just a lifeline for the student, but really a lifeline for their family uh, to be connected to critical resources. Thanks, Curtis. Uh, I think we all recognize, especially being here tonight with, with you, Aspire, there's great power in partnership, especially in college access work. And I'm wondering if all of you can speak a little bit about how you've partnered with community and college access organizations and educational institutions 
to more broadly support students and how, if at all, that's kind of changed or um, been challenged uh, over the last eight months? Rob, I'll talk about two partnerships we've had this year. One, I mentioned our partnership with Benefits Data Trust, um, who have a lot of expertise in um, supporting families and, and students um, through, through benefits processes. And we worked with them um, to help build this chat bot uh, that enables us to be able to really scale assistance uh, to students. Uh, and it's been a, a great example of organizations with different expertise coming together um, to build something new. You Aspire was, was really helpful in, in giving us advice and guidance throughout the sort of building process of, you know, what are the biggest questions that students are going to have? What's the most important message that messages that they need? Um, we did a lot to really sort of train the the tool so that it's it's really informed um, by by the sort of best expertise out there. Um, so for us, that was a really exciting example of of a tool that felt very timely. Um, that we think is sort of really helping meet, meet a need right now. Um, we've also been partnering um, with organizations like Strive for College um, and making, they, they mentor students um, through the college process and sort of making that connection and available to students um, so that, you know, if they are looking for a mentor right now, they have a, another way to sort of uh, engage um, with, with a mentor and find them. So just some examples of the way that we're hoping to play a connector role, um, both for organizations that have tremendous expertise and can help uh, support students, but then also provide that caring advice uh, that we know is so important right now. Rob, I'd, I'd put a qualifier and put it in front of partnerships and, and talk about in terms of transformative partnerships, uh, because there's an exchange there. There's a, uh, there's a resource exchange and a mutual benefit. Uh, two types of partnerships that I'll speak to. Uh, we partner with um, a number of uh, community-based organizations that are really focused on the hybrid college model. And so we're talking about uh, Duet in Massachusetts, uh, Peloton U in Texas, uh, Rivet Schools on California. There's a whole Noble Schools in Chicago. I mean, there's a whole consortium of, 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 of organizations and we provide uh, the support and the content um, for, uh, for them to really leverage uh, experiences for students and learners to earn, um, earn a degree through a competency-based education format. Um, and so that, that's one set of partnerships and there's quite a few there. And then I'll just uh, mention one that uh, Jennifer and I, uh, that we have through uh, College Board and SNHU, uh, where um, our work in the global sphere, where we're actually doing refugee education, again, through partnerships with uh, in-country partners delivering uh, competency-based education programming uh, for uh, associates and bachelor's degrees. And through our partnership with the College Board, uh, the College Board actually helps to sponsor some of the on-the-ground counselors um, who actually provide that support. And so the transformative nature of partnerships where there's that mutuality of value and the value is really focused on, on the learner. Great. Andrew, I love that um, prefix on the partnerships because <laughs> uh, that's how we see them as, as, as well. And um, yeah, I'll just go back to the Oakland Promise. I could, I mean, there's literally hundreds of partners engaged in the Promise, starting from the Brilliant Baby through the college access and counseling component, uh, higher ed partners across the country from our local community colleges and others, historically black universities, mm -hmm. uh, the UC and the CSU system. Uh, um, there's so many, there's so many partners that uh, we've had in terms of just like the FAFSA and even some of the college pieces, you know, USU Spire is actually a partner at the College Bound Brotherhood, uh, the Marcus Foster Educational Institute. There's just literally dozens of partners that are coordinated and aligned in this effort um, and literally working hands-on in many of our schools uh, through the future centers, through our college counseling system to uh, really support our kids to um, get access uh, to college. So and I could, there's many other partners that I, I, I could speak to them, even just on, on the tech side in terms of some of the systems we've built to ensure that, um, you know, really no kid falls through the cracks in terms of having a 360 view of young people, you know, with early warning indicators, 
uh, and really making sure that all the conditions of their life and all the resources that they need are being addressed uh, to again, help them to um, complete um, their K-12 career uh, and get into college. Thanks. So I guess a question for all of you is, um, and maybe this has been a interesting period to kind of think about these things, but you know, what do you all think that we're getting right right now in the way that we're serving students today? And what are learnings that you've been identifying in terms of things we should pay attention to as we try to solve for pathways and ecosystems and opportunities as we kind of emerge into a post-COVID kind of educational space? I think one of the things that we might hear that we're getting right is that uh, for some of our traditionally aged learners, they're saying, well, well, finally, you've caught up with us in terms of <laughs> <laughs> how, how we like to engage with content. Uh, so there's that. And, you know, much as Curtis and Jennifer have mentioned, we, we do realize that there are still are some inequities in the systems that we uh, that we have. But uh, part of the, the problem that we're trying to solve is again, how do you use technology as an enablement tool to actually increase that level of access? Um, so when we think about uh, accessibility, how do you factor that in as an enablement tool? Also thinking about this affordability um, aspect of things. And so we typically, uh, you know, our definition of affordability is that it's at a, it's at a cost um, that, that, can, that someone can make. Um, but how do you think about the efficiencies in these new systems of teaching, learning, of access and success that actually help to drive down cost. And so we're not just talking about affordability at that transactional point, but actually thinking about affordability um, as, a, uh, as an experience in that it, it actually unleashes um, um, more opportunities for learning, for those pathways to engage in those ecosystems um, in ways that are flexible, in ways that are you know, sort of just in time. Uh, the content and the pace allows for uh, the kind of achievement of credentials and um, wh whatever that opportunity might be. And so I, I think it's really unleashing some real opportunities for us to think very differently, um, even in a highly regula regulated environment, how do we think differently about, uh, about this access and affordability? Um, just to push on that a little bit, how are you thinking about it? Well, that's our secret sauce, Rob. No, just <laughs> no, well, no, well. So, so here's some very practical, uh, very practical examples. So, the work that we're doing in our refugee education, we, we're um, learning that we could actually uh, find um, um, ways to decrease the cost of assessments. And so, when you decrease the cost of assessment and evaluation, then that's less of a cost potentially to the learner. Um, as we think about how do you use technology as a tool for enablement, um, you can build more modularity that allows for greater scale, which really continues to drive down the cost, both in terms of content as well as uh, um, supports and other services. And so there's a whole way of kind of framing it that if you raise that as a question, and again, if you think about it as from a learner-centric perspective, not from what's best for me as the executive vice president or what's best for this institution, but what's best for the learner, what creates value for the learner, then you're actually operating from a different paradigm. Curtis? That's a really, that's a tough question. Um, we're getting it a lot. I feel like I'm um, far head deep in COVID still. And we are trying to um, really be very cognizant about what we need to start memorializing, codifying, and institutionalizing moving forward that's going to make us better for kids. And I mean, we do have to absolutely, you know, and we have been looking at those pieces and learning. I mean, just around closing the digital divide, I mean, went from a district that was around, most schools were two to one in the, you know, two kids for every computer in the classroom. Uh, we had some schools with, you know, other types of funding, particularly in high school that were one to one, but certainly had a huge gap. And we've purchased through our Oakland Undivided campaign now 35,000 computers, over 10,000 hotspots. And equipping kids in the home, um, it's the hardware is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
um, and providing the right type of tech support to the student, the teacher, and the family across language, uh, cultural um, pieces is really quite complex, way more than we thought. But I feel like we're getting to the point where we're becoming a much more digital city as a result of this. And, and in partnership with the mayor's office, you know, looking at things like citywide broadband and really, again, this long-term commitment to closing the digital divide. Uh, but also even on the teacher side, I think it was a great opportunity. We really rolled out some really robust teacher professional development around all the different platforms we're using around delivering high quality instruction um, in the virtual environment. We probably, I wish I had known Adrian, you know, six months ago, he probably could have been tutoring us on, on best in class. Um, so that was actually a major lift to kind of like retool our entire system in that. But I think we've We've learned a lot. We actually, for the first time, you know, bought every single one of our teachers a really good quality device. I mean, they would, you know, because they didn't need it, they, you know, the standard device was a Chromebook. And um, in the virtual environment, there's major limitations with using a Chromebook. And so, um, you know, how do we maintain that and how do we continue to build uh, teacher capacity in the digital environment to be able to, um, you know, one, I think we're learning that personalization, which we know is important, is yep. even more important. Um, knowing we have kids that are actually thriving better in the virtual environment than in the class environment. Um, and then there's a whole bunch to, to do just around how do we really support families to be able to support their kids in a digital environment? So there's a lot of work we're doing with grassroots community organizations and family engagement to support parents around the use of technology, how their kids get engaged, uh, which is a pretty heavy lift. So I feel like there's some really important pieces we're learning. And then, you know, what I hope is that we're really gonna be maximizing like our master teachers so that we can really, you know, folks that can teach, you know, have expertise and a passion in the subject, you know, we shouldn't be bound by the, you know, the 24, 25 to one teacher. There's lots of ways I think for us to start thinking beyond the, the, the classroom and the school walls around what education looks like. And we've launched a number of community-based in-person learning hubs, even though we're still 100% online. And so we're even finding ways of enhancing and augmenting instruction and student supports with non-educators, um, with youth development people and other types of organizations. And so like, how do we build on those partnerships to continue to build a really strong um, you know, education support system for our, our kids? Um, Curtis, just to pull on that a little bit briefly, as you think about some of these changes, how are you thinking about them in terms of, are these just temporary or are these actually going to be permanent changes? Yeah, that's, that's really a great question. Um, we're actually going to, I mean, some of them I think are going to be, I mean, I think the way that we're thinking about technology for the long haul, you know, even in terms of what now because we we are pretty much saturated. I mean, we had a lot of limitations, even the types of projects that students could get to take home. Even when you think about like at the high school level, um, because we knew that we kids did not have technology at home. So I think there's going to be a lot of instruction that's going to be open to kids. Uh, we have kids in engineering and media pathways that we even got much better. Uh, we didn't give them Chromebooks. We gave them devices that they can actually engage in those because we're, we're probably close to 90% of our kids are in a link learning career pathway in high school. Some of those, like I said, in computer science, engineering, media require higher end devices that they have in their schools, uh, but they don't have at home. And so now they have them at home as well. And so I feel like there's some things that's going to open up even what our teachers were able to do or not do before that were definite limitations um, previously. Um, and then I think just um, there's a whole lot we can do and we have a lot of teachers collaborating with our academics team to really kind of codify and think about, you know, how we can diversify and personalize and differentiate instruction, which I think is always, you know, you know the sweet spot you're trying to get to even in, in, in classroom instruction. Um, and then I think a lot of these other partnership pieces that we're working on with, with technology and um, getting connected to kids in many, many different ways. Many of our systems around student supports have actually functioned quite well in the virtual world. All of, every one of our schools has a coordination of services team 
we were fortunate that we've worked for a while with Salesforce to build a world-class um, system in their K-12 education cloud that literally is like a, I compare it to an electronic medical record uh, in the K-12 world to be able to track in real time, all the different adults that are in the life of a child supporting them, the nurse, the social worker, the community school manager, the community partner. Uh, and we, we have a really good system where we develop care plans for students based on referrals. And now we can actually do that in real time. So the teacher can just go online, send in the referral, and it's all just happening. And it's kind of like operationalizing equity is the way that I call it, because we're getting kids what they need when they need it. Um, and, but again, these systems are working really well in the virtual environment. We've been referring kids, we've made virtual home visits, we've been doing all kinds of things in the student support arena that's critical to helping kids stay engaged in their instructional life and staying on track to graduation. Great, thank you. So we have time for one question that we've uh, gotten through uh, participants and it is, are any of you working individually or collectively on the policy end of access to improving digital access, possibly including require internet, inter, requiring internet providers, most of whom are monopolies in their communities to provide free or subsidized service to low income families or in any other ways? My short answer to that is no and not anything actively. I mean, we, we clearly see internet access as just being essential in, in particular, um, we, we see in rural schools, um, sort of just access to hotspots and sort of other strategies are, are just far more difficult to, to implement. And so, you know, we think that's gonna be incredibly important to do. Um, you know, across a range of schools to really make sure that that kids have that internet access, um, and in particular that high speed internet access that really enables virtual learning. Yeah, uh, Rob, I think my my, my uh, second answer to that is uh, no, not actively, uh, but what we're doing is we're we're really building uh, the tech stock tech stack internally uh, to try to mitigate as many of those. Uh, those challenges as possible. So if we can carry the burden of of that within our tech infrastructure and our digital environment, then that means it's less of a demand or burden on the learner or the student from where she, he, or they are. Got it. Yeah, Rob, you just put a hit on one of my like real, um, I don't know, a pet peeve. I just like when you, when this whole COVID thing broke out and you're on the ground and you're trying to close the digital divide and you realize that you're in a 100% private sector environment and you're trying to solve a social issue, yep. it's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so literally from the governor's office, the SPI's, all, I've been in touch with all of them. Uh, we've done letter, we've, we've been trying to be engaged in policy discussion, but even the governor himself or State Superintendent Tony Thurman, you're still going to T-Mobile and to AT&T and all of them and negotiating, you know, basically you're negotiating the best government rate you can get, but you still got to come up with the money and you still got to figure it out. And so, you know, that idea of like, you know, what, um, what needs to be put in the public square around a basic need, I mean, for me, um, you know, Wi-Fi access, you know, should be as fundamental as your plumbing for your water, your gas, your electricity. <laughs> like, I mean, the way the world works now, it is as fundamental. And if, you know, any of us know, like the second that this thing goes down, we're in a panic, just like we would be if our, you know, we had to call the rotor router, you know, it's that level of like, I need it right now. And so, you know, the fact that that entire sector is private presents some real policy challenges when it comes to solving those issues. I mean, luckily in Oakland, our city council has taken on a pretty significant broadband uh, effort uh, to, uh, to be able to start building out citywide broadband. And there's other things that we're trying to do, even on this Oakland Undivided campaign, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations around how we're going to sustain keeping 35, 40,000 computers in kids' hands, um, you know, over the long haul and what that's going to take. And so, 
you know, we're, we're engaged. We, we actually, we have our own uh, lobbyist in Sacramento as a school district. We work on a lot of ed policies with, and so we're going to stay really actively engaged on the policy side uh, around this digital divide. Cause it, it could easily be something like you said in six months or 12 months to your earlier comment that, you know, oh, we, we kind of solved that for the moment and life will move on until the next crisis hits. And then we had never solved it again. And so I don't want to waste this opportunity um, and be in this boat again when we're needing everybody to be connected um, in the future. Great, thank you. And I'm getting the signal that we are out of time. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Curtis. And thank you, US Fire, for hosting this great opportunity. And I'm going to turn things over to Amit Patel. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Rob. Uh, and I'll reiterate, thank you to Jennifer, Dr. Adrian, and Curtis for that fantastic panel and conversation on equitable accessibility in the K-12 through higher education sectors. And thank you to all of you for attending this evening's event. event. Uh, my name is Amit Patel. And similar to Jen, uh, I'm one of US Fire's national board members and the co-chair for this evening's event. And US Fire's mission to ensure all young people have access to an affordable college degree is something that's been near and dear to my wife's heart and, and my heart. Madhu Punjabi is my wife. She's on this call as well. And you know, being the uh, children of immigrants, we've seen the impact that a college education has had on you know, our parents' lives and, and subsequently our lives and, and a major reason why we've been uh, supporters of US Fire. And the last panel's discussion was quite informative on how online and mobile technologies, you know, kind of offer resources as well as personalizing support uh, to degree attainment during and, and post COVID-19, which is critical for all students. I'm equally excited about the next panel, uh, which will be discussing the EdTech investment landscape, uh, the importance of leadership diversity and other opportunities as well as challenges for the EdTech sector. Uh, please join me in welcoming four of the most knowledgeable individuals about the education uh, technology sector, Natasha from TechCrunch, Jamira from Cowboy Ventures, Claudine from Salesforce Ventures, and Isabel from Imaginable Futures. Thanks so much, Amit. Um, thank you all for joining us. I'm really excited to talk about the money and where it's going and how we can make it go to the right things, to put it not so eloquently. Um, I would love for the panelists to start by introducing themselves a little bit. Um, first up, we have Claudine. Would love for you to introduce us, introduce yourself and tell us where you are coming from. Hi, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Amit um, and Jen and the rest of the U Aspire board and team um, and my fellow panelists. It's really great. Um, this topic is near and dear to my heart as well. I am dialing in from my home in San Francisco. Um, you may hear and or see my children pop in the background, uh, which is now a common and I think delightful occurrence um, in this global pandemic that we're in. Um, but it also has notions of distance learning and educational equity always top of mind for me um, as a parent as well as an investor. I work at Salesforce where I lead an impact fund. Um, we focus on investing in enterprise technology solutions and we look for both strategic connections to our platform, as well as demonstrable social and environmental impact. And one of the core areas that we invest in is education technology, as well as workforce development. Amazing. Well, I think your kids will be more appreciated than their parents <laughs> in the background who might make an appearance. So we shall see what happens. Um, Jamira, I would love for you to also give us a little introduction. Thanks, Natasha. Um, and thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be on this panel, especially with a lot of my friends that I already know and love so dearly. Um, I am Jamira. I am currently at Cowboy Ventures. We are a seed stage focused firm. So we're investing in early stage companies. We are a generalist firm based out here in Palo Alto, but I tend to focus on anything related to the future of work. Um, and I always describe it as things that are not necessarily collaboration or productivity software, but rather companies, products, and services that actually help people become agents of their career and agents of their lives. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time there. And then before this, I was at a firm called Emerson Collective, where I mostly focused on education and employment related companies. And um, I'm excited to be here in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And Isabel would love for you to finish us off. 
Yeah, hi everyone, um, and thank you to you, Aspire, to um, in putting this wonderful event together. Uh, thank you, Amit, also for the invitation and for your leadership here. Um, I uh, work for Imaginable Futures. Um, we are the spin-off for the Omidia Group, focused on education. Um, the Omidia Group is a philanthropic investment vehicle of the uh, Omidia family, Pierre Omidia being the founder of eBay. So in my day-to-day -day work, I, um, I invest both in philanthropy and make grants into non-profit and impact investments into uh, for-profit organizations in the future of learning. And Curtis, on the prior panel, used some magic word for us, uh, cradle to career. Uh, that's exactly um, what I'm focused on, cradle and career, maybe not the two. Uh, so cradle in the sense of early education, uh, most of my portfolio is focused on the early years, um, as well as um, uh, adult learners, um, uh, the career side of uh, the cradle to career. Um, and excited to be here um, and be part of this discussion. Awesome. Um, so I think the last panel did a really interesting job of explaining all the partnerships and energy that's needed to stop kids from falling through the cracks and make sure learning happens in a comprehensive and effective way. Um, and the reason ed tech um, from the venture capital perspective always excites me because I see like this opportunity to put millions into supercharging one solution over another. It's a huge responsibility. And I know all three of you are decision makers in this way. And so I'm curious, like just to start maybe, what, you know, where should the money be going? And what are the kind of technologies that are giving you and, and showing you like a truly equitable opportunity for learners? Um, maybe Jamira, you can start us off. I know you focus on like the um, adult learning and lifelong learning space a lot. Yeah, totally. So in terms of where the money should be going, I guess I'll take a step back and I'll say like, there are some solutions that lead to equitable outcomes that shouldn't necessarily be venture backed. Like there, that's the first thing that I should say is like, there are some venture, there are some like things that, and some solutions that need to be created where venture like outcomes and venture backable outcomes, like don't make as much sense. Like if you think about, and Natasha, you and I have talked about this a lot, like what venture requires is scale really quickly and really cheaply right? Like that's generally what you're looking for. And for like some solutions that you're trying to build, it doesn't necessarily work. So like putting that aside in terms of where I think dollars should be going, um, I'm personally spending a lot of time looking at adult learning solutions um, that are rethinking how we think of traditional college settings um, to be more affordable, to be more accessible, particularly in careers where um, you are able to develop really strong relationships with employers and be able to place students in those careers. Um, and so, and the reason why, like, I think that's important is that that's not true right now for a lot of careers. The reason why bootcamp started in, with software engineers is because it was pretty easy to assess software engineers uh, to begin with, right? Like, there is a technical assessment that employers can say, like, okay, this person knows how to do this job. Um, and now we can translate that to other jobs, but there's a lot of jobs where that doesn't exist. And so we're spending a lot of time looking at solutions like in healthcare, for example, or in manufacturing or in cybersecurity, where you're able to actually build relationships with employers and be able to place um, people in those uh, opportunities. And so ultimately really looking for uh, companies and play in uh, players that are able to make current alternative learning higher ed solutions, again, more affordable, more accessible, and also actually more effective <laughs> than how we think of a lot of uh, colleges and universities right now. Yeah, Claudine, I would love for you to chime in here from the perspective of impact investing at Salesforce. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with Jamira's first point that not all solutions out there should be venture backed. And I think if you look at Salesforce's work 
more broadly across the education and workforce development spectrum, you know, you see Jen Stradler's great work on the .org side supporting a host of fantastic nonprofits um, that are doing fantastic work when it comes to um, education and college access and workforce development. And um, Salesforce is also supported with a lot of money, um, our large urban public school districts where we have a presence. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of money that needs to come from, you know, private philanthropy as well as government, <laughs> of course. Um, adventure is a piece of that puzzle for certain solutions. Um, we tradition, we, you know, so far in our three plus years of investing for impact have focused primarily on the higher ed space as well as the workforce development space. And that's because we are very much a strategic investor. So we kind of go where our products lead us. Um, Salesforce has for a long time sold into higher ed. We have a big presence there. Um, and our, our solutions for higher ed are wide ranging and, and really start with, you know, everything from admissions to recruiting all the way through um, donor advancement. But there's a growing focus on student success within higher ed. And so from an impact perspective, that's where I have focused my time. Um, our, our, you know, our broad goal within our ed tech and workforce development um, investment streams is to increase more equitable opportunities um, for populations who have been traditionally underserved for various reasons um, to ensure more equitable outcomes in education that ultimately lead to high quality jobs. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to higher ed, thinking about student success products that um, increase student persistence, for example, since we know that, you know, a good 40% of people who start college don't finish and end up graduating with also a ton of debt. Um, we have also looked a lot at workforce development, given our own role in you know, digital transformation. Um, we recognize that as a company, we have an opportunity to you know, help create a new job ecosystem for people um, to get access to jobs of not just the future, but today um, that don't require necessarily a four-year college degree. Um, and so uh, similarly to Jemaya, we're, we're very interested in solutions that um, are tied to, you know, employers, um, whether it's industry specific or not. Um, and we see our own, our own role in that. And, you know, we can, um, we can benefit from it uh, by training people and finding solutions that, that, it, you know, generally um, benefit the digitally transformed environment of today. Yeah, Isabel, please chime in with your um, earlier education investing, because I understand you also kind of look at K through 12. Yeah, and one one point of connection is um, about the, the college student population, which actually is quite large, um, which we call student parents. Um, one out of four college students um, is also a parent. Um, and that group of students is one that typically is um, duly motivated for their children and for themselves. And so access to childcare is uh, critical for that population. So childcare overall in the, cri in the crisis that we are in right now is critical for you know, many uh, parents that are not necessarily studying, but maybe working, uh, but certainly for student parents is a critical need. So um, we have made a number of investments in, in childcare and um, that's an area where we would love to see more, more innovation. Um, over um, areas of um, um, exciting um, innovation, parental engagement um, is also another area where uh, during the crisis, if any one of you is a parent, we are all feeling this, um, this, uh, this void right now of connecting with schools and with, uh, with the education of our children. So there are some digital tools that are looking at new forms of uh, family engagement that are really exciting. Um, and then in the area of um, um, uh, education to career, um, um, a lot of needs in navigation guidance overall. Um, the future of work is quite murky. Um, so how do we guide uh, people toward, um, uh, um, toward jobs of the future that may or may not exist today? Totally. I think something that I'm, I'm curious if you guys are seeing this too is like a lot of solutions out there are putting the payment pressure on consumers <laughs> now that, um, sorry, let me shut that. 
my mic got messed up. Um, it's putting it on the consumers now that schools are closed or now that campuses are closed. You know what, since you're home, we'll make you pay for it and you'll get this really good education, but now you have to pay for it. And so it's creating this divide. And so I'm curious, um, when you're looking at companies, are you looking for ones that are going the enterprise slower sales route? Or are you looking at the B2C route, which I think has kind of been broken open by COVID? I think, sorry, I'll just take a quick stab at this. Um, so at least for us, it one, it totally depends on like whether we're talking about early childhood, K-12, higher ed, because they're all different sets of populations. Um, in general, at least for us, we tend to be shy about companies that are selling into K-12 or like school systems. Um, and we tend to be shy about companies that are selling directly to colleges and universities, unless they're planning on monetizing from like the enterprise or the employer side at some point. Um, and so we tend to either focus on enterprise solutions that are selling to employers. And a good example of this is actually a company Claudine and I share, which is Guild Education, um, that sells into employers uh, like Walmart and Lowe's and Disney and is able to provide uh, education opportunities to um, through college for frontline workers. And so like, it's a great way to actually combine the need for equality and impact and equity but also doing it in a way that can lead to venture sized outcomes because they're able to get most of the money either via employers or via the uh, university partners that they have. And so it's kind of like this beautiful model that actually as it grows, it's, um, it leads to higher equity. But in general selling for us, selling into K-12 or higher ed, is, it's just long sales cycles. It's tough on a venture model. It's definitely not um, out of the question. We've seen some companies that have done really incredibly um, but we have been focusing on more of the consumer side and hoping that at scale, they're able to bend the cost curve so that you can actually increase the amount of uh, accessibility that you can have for larger populations. And I'm, I'm happy to jump off from um, uh, what Jemaira shared. Um, huge fan of Guild. Um, but you know, as, as an enterprise software company and investor, uh, that that is our thesis. So, um, as, as to contrast, um, you know, how Jermaira and her cow, and her team at Cowboy Invest, um, we actually don't look for DSC solutions and education technology, but rather we look for enterprise because we invest with a strategic lens. So we're looking for companies that we can actually partner with and go to market with. And as I already mentioned, um, we have you know a large presence in higher ed. Um, so we're our our team running the education cloud is you know actively looking for solutions that can complement what we are offering um universities and and we're also working in k-12 as well um we do have our own you know hesitations about the, the lengthy sales cycles um in both k-12 and higher ed but i would say you know um the the things that make us feel comfortable about the enterprise approaches um one we know it um and and two i think that it, it actually is where we get most comfortable in terms of impact and equity. Um, because particularly when you're thinking about like a K-12 solution, if you're selling directly to parents, it's, inev it's inevitably going to create strat uh, stratification in terms of who can afford it, who cannot. So from an equity and impact standpoint, I'm most excited about solutions that are targeting large urban public school districts um, to ensure that the tools are getting in the hands of any student who needs them and not just in the hands of uh, the parents who can afford them. Um, but, and then the second point I was gonna say is, I think we've also seen a shift in 2020 um, in terms of sales cycles because of you know the rapid digital transformation that's happening. You know what would have taken five to ten years is now happening over the course of one to two years as schools are waking up to the fact that they are behind um, in their digital capabilities. We're seeing that as a company at Salesforce, um, and we're seeing it with with companies that we're looking at as potential investments. Um, and so I think that you know the sales cycles may not. Well, may not always stay this short, but I think something is is shifting thanks to the situation we're in. Yeah, and for us, because we are impact uh, first investors, um, while we have a few investments that are B two C. Um, um, selling directly to, to parents. There are very, very few of them in our portfolio. Um, we really favor um, uh, those organizations that um, either sell to employers or have a uh, employer funding model or uh, have partnership with uh, with government, whether they are 
school districts um, had started in the early years or colleges in, uh, in higher education. Awesome. And just and wonder... Actually, yeah, if I add, actually, this is one of my biggest concerns right now in the current environment in, uh, in the venture world. Uh, I see some amazing, amazing leading VCs coming in into education. They all have a consumer uh, thesis because that's where um, you can potentially make uh, money in education for middle class and higher uh, income parents. Uh, but I'm very concerned that this trend will increase inequities um, that we are experiencing during this crisis. Yeah, and just to add to this, like I don't think that there's any question that there is an increasing divide over the past year. Like the past year, and, and anecdotally, my my younger sister is actually working at KIPP over the past year, and even she mentions like none of the like all of these students will have to likely redo this year. There's no real learning that's happening right now, and understandably so, right? You're at your home. It likely is a chaotic environment. Um, one, like learning via Zoom is not necessarily the most engaging way to learn. There's so much that's lost in what you would normally have in a traditional classroom setting. You don't have that social engagement that you would normally have. Um, and so there's a lot of learning that is lost in the past year. And the folks that are getting ahead are the ones that are able to afford the pod families or the like pod tutors. And so it's, a question of like, there are some things that you're doing as a venture capitalist just by nature of like, this is an opportunity to invest in something um, that you think is going to get really great returns. But it's not, at least personally, it's not lost on me that a lot of these companies that are succeeding as a result likely will have um, huge disparities and gaps in terms of student outcomes. I think one more point I'll add on to that is that a lot of companies do start as as D to C, particularly in say, um, you know, the digital skilling space. But then they actually are looking to um, break into an enterprise model too. And so I think that that's another opportunity to um, reach a wider audience. Um, it brings up, you know, it, though it can be difficult and challenging sales cycles to sell into employers. It ultimately, can can be a more cost effective approach to acquiring students. Um, and being able to access more more people who maybe can't pay for the product themselves, and so solutions that Jamara sees or Isabel um, sees or I see that are purely D2C right now, uh, you know, I, a lot of times I, I see an opportunity for them to eventually also become an enterprise offering, and that um, can be both good from a business and impact standpoint eventually. Awesome. Yeah. And I wanted to remind everyone listening in to send some questions over if you have any in the chat function and I'll get to them. And we're also live tweeting from at you aspire. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about what you all were kind of um, talking about just now, which is like this growing even second version of the digital divide. I, it's it's the, the software, it's, it's this learning pods. And I think like, is there this is a weird question, but like, are there any ways that people can look for red flags early on to make sure they're not investing in those or not trying to contribute to the demand, like is art to the divide? Um, are there certain questions that you ask or certain things you really look for, even from a website, so you make sure you're not contributing to that um, potential divide? I think a really straightforward first question um, that's always top of mind for me is who are you, who are your end users? Um, literally, who are they? Where do they live? Um, what do the demographics look like? If it's K twelve, what percentage of these students um, are on a free and reduced lunch um, programs? You know, and what or if it's a higher ed, um, who is receiving financial aid? Um, you know, what are the proxies we can use to understand essentially how underserved is the population? Um, and I think that is a really good starting point to understanding kind of where where in this you know population um, the solution is is coming in. The one wrinkle I will add is. There is some basic infrastructure work that we obviously have to do around just access to Wi-Fi, internet, mm -hmm. access to devices. 
because there's been research done that shows that even Khan Academy, which is free, has in some ways actually increased the amount of inequity because the people that have access to infra like internet, Wi-Fi, computer devices, and then parents that encourage them to do it are going to do it versus the ones that don't. And so like even free options, there's going to be some wrinkle or complication around inequities. And so like there is a piece around just like the basic infrastructure that also has to, or actually most importantly has to be dealt with mm -hmm. um, before even just like the, you, you start thinking about the implications of, of the business models that you're investing in. But I totally agree with uh, Claudia on that. 100%. There's actually an article in New York Times um, today about um, this exact topic. Uh, the title is Think Local About the Digital Divide. Um, and it highlights actually the work of one of our portfolio companies, not in education technology, but in sustainability, um, that did essentially like a do-it-yourself broadband internet uh, installation in a neighborhood in the Bronx. Um, and it's, but it's just pointing out that this is, this is a problem in many places in this country, let alone the rest of the world. So agree that, that there is some very basic infrastructure that we need to have in place for more equitable outcomes. Yeah, Natasha, to questions such as, I mean, what is the impact that uh, you're having? Very, very direct questions, or uh, how are you closing the gap? whether it's uh, the achievement or the, um, the opportunity gap. Uh, I mean, those are very, very, you know, related to what Claudine explained on, on, on who you are serving, but those are very, very direct questions that we ask all the time. The other question that I like also is one that's more about the uh, team and the uh, leader, the entrepreneur, um, about the motivations for uh, starting uh, or for doing what they, he or she is doing. Um, yeah. The other question that I think is also important, especially companies that are focused on educating learners, um, even if they like somehow leverage an ISA model or income share agreement model or deferred tuition model, models in which like allow for increased accessibility. Um, I spent a lot of time digging into like, what are the wraparound services? Um, because if you don't actually have the uh, services or solutions to support students to get through the program, that's also related to income and it's also related to inequity, right? And so, um, and so like that's a piece that's that helps to like, that can increase inequity if they're not, even if they're like using an accessible or an affordable model, um, but if they're not serving students that may have more needs, um, then it can have unintended consequences that you wouldn't otherwise expect. Yeah, I wanted to end um, before we get into questions um, a little bit more meta, which is obviously the panel's about investing um, equitably and, and in, a, in a diverse way. Um, but I've noticed among ed tech investors, especially ed tech decision makers, just like a severe lack of diversity. A lot of the best funded ed tech companies out there have only one, or I mean, at, at most one female on the board. And you know, this panel wouldn't make you think that, but I think there's a lot of room to grow. And so, I mean, I would love for each of you to maybe like explain, um, you know, how is this impacting innovation? I don't know if I have a question there, but like, let's talk about that because that's just, I think a blaring gap and blind spot of ed tech right now. Yeah, uh, actually, ed tech is doing a little bit better than the rest of the venture industry, um, both on gender, uh, race, and ethnicity, and um, also a lot of educators uh, are starting um, um, companies or, or, or nonprofits. So um, diversity from different, you know, different different perspectives. Um, uh, but there is a lot, a lot to uh, to improve on. Um, uh, and my personal conviction is that it needs to start from the investor side. Um, I think the investor side is still not diverse enough. Um, I mean, as you as you said, Natasha, this panel is exceptionally diverse uh, uh, from many standpoints. Um, um, uh, but uh, when I when I look at uh, most of my portfolio organizations, most of the boards that I'm on, those are not uh, the reality that I live in every day. Um, so, um, and if you don't start with the investor side, 
then the networks are not representative of um, uh, of, of those, those investors. So, or they are, in, or they are representative of the investors. Um, uh, so, in other terms, the, the, the organizations are not diverse um, as a result. Uh, so, my strong conviction is that the diversity needs to start from the inside of, um, of um, venture and impact investing firms. And good news, if I may conclude there, is that there is a big push from limited partners uh, that I'm observing on that front. Um, uh, a lot of limited partners are investing in more diverse teams. They are asking more questions about the diversity of the teams from the VC side. Um. You know, Isabel, in, in a prior comment, you mentioned that one of the questions you ask is about the motivation of the of the founders um, in starting the said enterprise, and I, that's something that I think about a lot. And I think that when I when I look at my portfolio, some of the companies that I'm most excited about from an impact perspective are led by by founders who created them out of their own lived experience, and their own lived experience in, you know, in a big problem. Um, and maybe that was as a, as an end user in, in the education environment, maybe it was a teacher. So maybe they, they had a, they had a great, you know, education trajectory themselves, but ended up in a classroom and realized that, you know, the system is just, is just broken. Um, and they wanted to improve it and improve, you know, outcomes for the kids who are, are, are not getting access to the same resources as, as others. Um, and so I think understanding founder motivation is important. It's, it's not a prerequisite to come from an underserved background, certainly to be in our portfolio, but I think you know, those founders really bring something um, additional to the table um, when they're coming at it from that perspective. Yeah, um, I guess like just to 100% agree both with Isabel and Claudine, um, on the investor side, there's obviously a lot of work to be done and Natasha, just to kind of like respond directly to your point around the board, I, I think like specifically within ed tech, there is like a fairly diverse amount of investors within that space. But the thing about ed tech is often the companies that are very large or consumer oriented, which tend to be heavily filled with generalist investors. So, and as we all know, like 75% of venture capital firms do not have a female partner um, and people of color tend to be a rounding error as a result of most decision makers. And so tend to be a lot of white males. And the sad reality, or the reality is uh, similar to what Claudine was saying is a lot of the decisions that we make and a lot of the perceptions that we have is so driven by our lived experiences. So as a board member, the strategic advice that you're gonna give, the networks that you're gonna pull from are based off of your lived experience, right? And so like, if you haven't experienced a lot of the challenges that some of the learners that we serve experience or the users that we serve experience, like you're not gonna think about it. Um, and I can even like anecdotally say like for myself, like when I'm looking at a solution that is specifically serving learners, I think about like my mom who is trying to go back to school right now as someone who was a teenage parent who English is their second language. And so like, I think about what are the support services that she needs? Um, when I think about young K, to, K through 12 students, I think about what were the things that I needed as again, someone that was English as a second language, someone that was low income. And so like that just drives different decision makings and it also just drives different questions that you ask and it drives different ways in which you like shape a conversation at a board meeting um and it can lead to drastically different decisions uh and so unfortunately we're like in a situation right now where one it actually starts from the top lps are not diverse um and then venture investors as a result are also not diverse and then the people that we invest in are also not diverse um, and so there's a lot of change that has to happen across the spectrum. It's not just investors, it's LPs, it's founders, it's et cetera. Like it's a whole, you know, set of things that have to change, but it definitely, like, we can't tell ourselves that it doesn't impact the direction of companies because it definitely does. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, that is actually a perfect note to end on, just like a realistic, but also hopeful note considering who we are talking to today. Um, and so Claudine, Jamira, Isabel, thank you for your time. And I will pass it over to Jacqueline Pinero, you Aspire's CEO. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Natasha, and to all of our esteemed panelists for the information and really engaging conversation this evening. Um, thank you to each of you who set aside time this evening with, I'm sure, dinner on the stove and kids running around. I had my husband physically remove our children from our house just to make sure this goes off without a hitch. But um, we thank you for your time and your engagement this evening. And I wanna specifically thank our sponsors for this event, uh, the law firm Cooley and Amit and Madhu Patel. Thank you for your generous contributions to making this evening possible. Um, as Natasha said, my name is Jacqueline Pinheiro and I am proudly serving as you Aspire's new CEO. And I could not be more excited, energized and proud to be in this moment of working to find new ways to make equitable, affordable college pathways for the millions of learners across our country. Like Amit shared, this work is very personal to me. I'm the daughter of immigrant parents. I'm the first in my family to graduate college. And there truly isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about how my college degree has changed the trajectory of my life. And I am honored and deeply thankful to be in this position to help lead you aspire into its next set of success um, into the future. I want to close this out um, with a few things that I picked up as I listened to the conversations. Um, a few key themes that are critical for all of us to keep at the forefront. Eliminating inequities and the digital divide. Understanding what is our digital environment now and our digital ecosystem since the onset of the pandemic. The benefits that technology has to transform and to accelerate learning for students, but also importantly, how do those transformations and accelerations create connections to other important factors for success for students and families, such as childcare, such as access to benefits, such as connections to a strong workforce. How technology can enhance accessibility, affordability, and success factors. And finally, the most important for us, what is best for the student? I truly believe that together, not only those of us who are on the call here tonight, but for the larger systems across our country, K to 12, higher education, ed tech and VC communities, companies developing the jobs of the future, we have the unique opportunity to reimagine and harness the power of technological innovation to truly change the game for our students. Questions that stood out for me that were asked over the course of these discussions tonight that I will bring back to you Aspire to ensure that we are continuing to build upon the technology that lives in our DNA that Claire shared with you at the beginning. Those questions are, how do we use technology to continue to increase enablement and access? How do we use technology to create more flexible and nimble student-centered approaches? And really, how do we also use technology to address our business model costs? Um, Adrian from SNU talked a lot about that and that resonated very deeply. And also the conversation in the panel we just heard with our, our VC community is the scale. How do cost and scale come together for nonprofits um, that do live in quite resource constrained environments and how do we do better by each dollar that we have. So we can answer these questions together in partnership with one another and with students at the center. We at U Aspire see partnership as our key factor in the future success of not only our business, but in our success to breaking down the systemic barriers that exist on their, for students on their higher education journey. So to close us out, I'd like to just thank each and every one of you again for your time this evening. And a few call to actions for each of you that are joining us tonight and for those of you who will listen at a later date to this recording. Visit our website, learn more about our work, and reach out to the U Aspire friend that invited you to the panel tonight. We'd love to continue the conversation in different ways and shapes. Consider a donation, a direct donation to our work and to our ability to resource technological innovations and designs 
that help us increase access to affordable education for our students. And consider being our, one of our partners or introducing us to partners that you think we need to know and that you think there are deep connections that we can continue to build better systems and solutions for our students. So thank you again to each and every one of you, to your commitment to our students, to your commitment to our communities. I hope you are well, you stay well and stay safe as we endure the next set of months through the pandemic. Um, we look forward to, the, to continuing the conversation with you. And again, I wish you a very nice and restful evening. Thank you, everyone.